the next uh, speaker, um, the next speaker uh, and the presenter uh, on uh, our panel is uh, Naomi van der Velden, who's connecting with us today from um, from uh, Permaculture Association from the UK. And Naomi is uh, an ecologist uh, who's passionate uh, about uh, plant communities. She's also a practitioner with a 20 years experience of gardening. Um, as a senior researcher in Permaculture Association, she's been involved in the um, GROW Observatory project uh, and uh, has been uh, also delivering uh, online soil um, courses, or courses on soil. So it will be very, very interesting to hear from her on, uh, on uh, her reflections and uh, findings from different investigations. And today her topic is polycultures, people and permaculture with a focus on citizen science, invest citizen science investigation of productivity. Naomi, if you can um, connect and uh, can, you, can you connect? Can yeah, you hear uh, can you hear me? Perfect. I, I let you um, take over and you can uh, share your screen with us for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction um, and, and for organising such an amazing conference. I have, can't tell you how much I've been inspired by all, the, all of the presentations so far. I've had such interesting content. So thank you very much. I'm sure I have lots more questions for all of you. Um, I'm going to present actually three, very quickly, <laughs> results from three different experiments that we've been doing. Um, one is pictured on, on the left here, and these are all pictures from the, from the participants. One, one was a, a mixed veg trial in 2011, where we compared two different polycultures. Um, in 2018, as part of the Grow Observatory, we compared polyculture and monoculture, and then we continued that in a voluntary capacity uh, last year. So I'll present a little bit about all of those. Um, I didn't want to give you too much background because I think hopefully we already have an understanding that um, multi-species systems, which we've heard a lot about today, whether in terms of, of weeds, weed diversity or, or structural diversity in agroforestry, these are really important. Um, there's a really nice review, uh, quite old now, from, from Malatiu et al that highlights um, some of these different uh, aspects of it. So they can enhance ecological services, they can give better productivity, better reliability of production. Um, we, we've also just heard that with, with the monoculture bananas in, in Ecuador, that having that diversity can, can give some resilience um, and strong evidence for, for pest control as well. Um, what I've found, however, is um, in terms of productivity, um, there were very, very few academic studies of any system with three or more species, and partly because the method's quite complex and the, and the analysis is quite, quite difficult. Um, but despite that, there are an awful lot of practitioners, so people just growing food, lots of different crops all at the same time, um, sometimes very much in exactly the same place, um, and sometimes um, you know, just adjacent in, in allotments, in market gardens, in home gardens. And one of the things that those practitioners um, in a survey that we did a couple of years ago, they lots of people are doing are growing polycultures, but they don't know whether or not they work. So hopefully we'll give you some answers. So the first um, the first experiment was uh, 2011, um, and I was actually working as a senior lecturer at the University of Cumbria at that point, and I worked with the Permaculture Association. And we decided to grow a high diversity plot and a low diversity plot. So my co-authors were really keen on having a high diversity, having lots of plants in there. So we had a high diversity of 12 species and a low diversity of three crops. So in the three crop plot, we had peas, radish and spinach, which was actually perpetual spinach. Um, and in the high diversity plot, we had those plus all of the other um, crops that you see here, including one flower, so a Tatitis uh, marigold. We sent seeds that were kindly donated, we sent to um, 50 households in the UK and we got full data back from 26, which is, in terms of citizen science, more than 50% is amazing. Uh, and these participants did loads of work, so they measured each harvest of each crop, 
they noticed the, how they scored the crop quality and then they also made notes of, of how much time they put into the plots um, and anything that could have affected their results. Um, so these results are, are part of, um, that I'm going to show now, are part of that trial. Um, the, the, the whole thing is online, the easiest way to get it now is on, on my profile at ResearchGate. Um, so overall, between this low three crop mix and the high 12 crop mix, there was slightly more productivity per square meter from the high diversity, but statistically this wasn't significant. Just in case there are any other statistics geeks, um, we did a Wilcoxon signed rank paired test, which accounts, so it compares each site, low and high diversity with each other, a bit like comparing in human medical trials, the same person. And, and I appreciate there's lots of diversity between people. So it, this test helps us to appreciate there's lots of diversity between plots and the way people grow, but accounts for, um, that, that it takes that into account and then looks specifically at the diversity um, plot by plot. Um, there's no significant difference statistically between this low and high diversity mix. So again, a little bit of stats. Uh, if our p-value here was less than 0 0.05, then we would, ex we would expect there to be uh, a significant difference. Um, when we look per hour, so amount of time that people put into the plots, we see that the low diversity plot yielded more for your effort. Um, uh, not again, not quite significant, um, but certainly an interesting um, an interesting result to consider. And we in fact found that generally, and this we found in all studies, the people that have higher production from one plot type also have higher production from another. So either their site or the way they manage it has a strong influence on how much they produce. And we found that time, even though the times were quite vague estimates, time accounted for about 40% of the difference in productivity. And I just want to give some context to not these, these, this comparison, but the overall results. Oops, which I'm apparently not going to do because I messed up my slides. Sorry about that. Uh, I will go back and see how I undo that at some point. Sorry. Um, do you know what? I'm just going to read it off my screen. Here we go. So um, the average yields were equivalent to 35 tons per hectare. And as um, you found in the Czech Republic, Linda, we don't have data on how much people produce in their home gardens. Um, the best I could do was find from the British Horticultural Society. So they, their vegetable crops yield around 19 tons per hectare, but that includes some heavier crops like carrots and potatoes and some lighter crops. And then the only other data I could find on home production was this amazing 1948 document, so just post-war, um, where allotments were yielding about 16 tonnes per hectare and supplying around 10% of the UK production. Um, so, so it looks like these polycultures are yielding quite well. The, the second uh, experiment was the Great Grow experiment that we did in 2018. Um, the Grow Observatory is a Horizon 2020 funded um, citizen observatory with 19 different partners involved. Um, in this we decided to use that knowledge of the three species and compare three a low diversity, easier to manage but relatively productive plot with its constituent monocultures and we decided on climbing green beans um, to form canopy layer, uh, spinach to give some ground cover and radish uh, to give a little bit of a root crop um, going on. So the plots were at sizes are given here, they were spaced 50 centimetres apart to try and account for, um, uh, to try and avoid plot to plot influence. The total polyculture was a square metre and then these added up to 1.3 square metres. They had the same number of seeds in each, hopefully sown at the same times in the same conditions. <coughs> Um, what we found from these were um, for 70% of the people that harvested, the, their polyculture was the highest yielding per, per unit area. So in terms of grams or kilograms per square metre. This um, map shows uh, in black dots people that started the experiment but didn't complete. But we had a 50% completion rate, again, which is really high particularly for something that's so involved in terms of how much data people give. 
um, and the orange plots are the ones showing where monocultures yielded more. So for almost 30% of people, actually the monoculture worked better for them. Overall, um, polycultures yield significantly more, so you can see a good p-value relationship here, um, and that was largely made up for higher yields from the bean plots. Um, spinach, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my uh, uh, thing. So this is beans here, spinach, and then radish on the right. Um, the spinach didn't do so well in the polyculture, and, and radish was, was really no different. And again, those yield equivalents, um, 20 to 30 tonnes per hectare. Um, we were also, because we compared with a monoculture, we were also able to work out that land equivalent ratio. So similar to, uh, as we've seen for the agroforestry for that Wakeland's work, um, the land equivalent ratio is 1.25, which means you save 25% of your land, uh, or, or polycultures will yield about 25% more per land area than, than the monoculture plot components. So that's quite exciting. And then finally, um, a little bit of, uh, we tried to continue this experiment. The, the Grey Observatory unfortunately didn't continue this in their final year, but we um, just decided to do it anyway um, on a voluntary basis. So we used pretty much the same layout and similar crops. We just swapped the spinach for Swiss chard because loads of people had problems with spinach. 2018 was a really dry year in the UK and, and parts of Northern Europe and a really wet year in, in like Spain and Portugal. So we had lots of problems with, um, with spinach not growing well. So we switched this out for another leafy crop, um, a, a Swiss chard. And we kept the areas, the total areas the same as well to just account for that. So in this case, the polycultures that has slightly higher density. Um, we didn't get so many participants, you can see we've got quite a lot of variation. So this shows like how much one person's plot might, might vary from the average. So you can see there's a lot of variation and quite a bit of overlap. And monocultures slightly yielding more, um, but again, not at all significant um, difference because of this variation. Um, and again, be beans doing better. The rhubarb chards definitely seeming to prefer the monoculture. Um, very little difference in the radish. And again, those yield equivalents, polycultures, um, even at this scale, right? So this scale, compared to a monoculture wheat crop, our monocultures are 50 centimetres apart. Essentially, this is a polyculture from the perspective of most scales. Um, they're still yielding well, but even mixing these crops together gives us a higher overall yield. And in this case, because the monoculture was, was doing slightly better, largely due to the chard, um, you get slightly more uh, from the monoculture compared to the polyculture, so that land equivalent ratio is less than one. Um, that, that's everything that I'm going to say. I thought, I thought we just had 10 minutes. So um, I just want to say a huge thanks to all of you and to all the amazing experiment participants and these people have voluntarily given up their time and eagerly assessed what's going on in their growing spaces. And I think this is a really interesting um, and important aspect for permaculture research. I've been interested in this question of scale for a really long time. Um, and it's really interesting to hear those questions also come up for, from Denise. Um, you know, do, how does this compare to, to home gardens uh, in terms of insect diversity and, and also from um, from Linda, you know, these aren't permaculture practitioners. These people are gardeners. So some are doing permaculture, some are not. Um, so that's also an interesting area to explore. I'll, I'll stop now. There's some, some links you can find out more uh, about that research and what we're doing. Okay, thank you so much, Naomi. Um, it's uh, really inspiring to see that so many people uh, have taken the the time and uh, the kind of consistency to look at their uh, at their productivity in a way because it takes uh, the, it takes an attention that uh, is not easy to sustain actually when gardening is just a side activity uh, to your everyday life rather than the main uh, main occupation. There's a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one is um, from uh, Paul. It is, um, is access included when calculated yield per hectare and also uh, acknowledgements for your work? 
Uh, so is that uh, understandable for you, the question? Is access included when calculate the yield? Maybe... Ah, uh, yeah, right. If you, if you have, for example, if you leave uh, communication uh, tracks or pathways, uh, roads, etc., is that included in the hectare um, area? Ah, uh, okay. No, no. So we, we suggested that the plots were separated by paths. So yes, you're right. That, that, uh, and that was really to also have some separation so the plots weren't influencing each other or they weren't influenced by other vegetation. So yes, the total area set aside in somebody's garden for the experiment was much larger than two square meters to allow for that. And we, um, we haven't accounted for that in scaling up the, the, the per hectare uh, calculations at all. So, so no, um, yeah, that, and that's a good point. We, we should include that as well. I, I would also say that, that the yield per hectare is influenced you couldn't just grow one hectare of this um, because there's an influence of, of these edge effects as well. So often edges are more productive when the principles of permaculture, but also something I did in my PhD work on forests. Um, so this would be scaled up to a hectare by having 10,000 households each grow one square meter. So, you know, lots of home gardens across Europe um, and scaling up in that way. So again, th this is perhaps why our estimates are, are, are higher than um, what we're seeing e even from other market gardens. But yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a really useful point, Paul. And I'll definitely think about that as we write up. Um, and similarly, a question uh, about the methods of the research. Um, here from the audience, uh, from Robert. Um, he says, I cannot resist to ask, uh, your plot seem particularly small uh, in the research. Uh, a method. Did you include edge effect in your yield comparison? <laughs> so maybe I've just just answered that question a little bit. Um, so the, the the plots were deliberately small to make it accessible for people. So even we had we had over we had almost two hundred people that were interested in participating, and even quite a lot of those didn't have space, um, even at this scale. So we wanted to to have small plots to enable as many people as possible to participate without taking up too much of the other stuff that they're often growing in, in quite a small growing space. Um, so that's why, why they're small. Um, and absolutely no, we haven't, we haven't and can't at the scale take into account edge effects, which is why I, I say scaling up isn't grow 100 by 100 square meters of a polyculture, scaling up is 10,000 households each growing one square meter. Um, at, so yeah, that, that's not accounted for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. It's a, it's a kind of different distribution of the uh, scaling up effect, right? Because we're looking at small, small places rather than expanding in a, in a territorial uh, sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I'm really, I still, I've had a PhD project in mind for ages, <laughs> but not yet secured funding of what, what are the effects at different scales? So going from households, you know, your own back garden, a couple of square meters to a market, gar to, to a market garden, a home garden, to a commercial farm, and just seeing how, how do these differences change? And we don't know, we don't know the answers to these questions, but for a lot of um, the polyculture research across the field, you know, so insects, plant biodiversity, productivity, soils, so much to investigate.